to Monday, um, start of a new week. Um, as I said in my last weekly vlog that I was going to finish Carrie last night and then got distracted by TikTok. So that didn't happen. Um, but I am reading Carrie today. Um, I'm getting close to the halfway mark. It is relatively short. It's one of King's shorter books. Um, well, compared to the next book he published, which was Salem's Lot, which was hefty. It's like six, seven hundred-ish pages, depending on your edition. Um, so, yeah, I'll be able to finish Carrie today. And then I think I'm going to try and get my ten chapters in Malice in the way. Because that's only like 80 pages, I think. Yeah, chapter 10 starts on page 81. So I'm going to try and read this first section of Malice. Um, and if I can do both of those today, then I'm going to start People We Meet on Vacation. Um, which is my second pick for round two of the Major Arcana Readathon. Um, yeah, and then we will go from there. So, yeah, Carrie is obviously a very well-known story. Girl with telekinetic abilities is bullied um, eventually snaps and just goes batshit crazy. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm really enjoying it. Um, if you've watched the movie version, um, the original movie version with Sissy Spacek, um, it plays out almost the same. Except in the book, we get um, excerpts of interviews, publications, journals, uh, memoirs about what is known as the White Incident um, with what happened to and caused Carrie White to go crazy. Um, so it's, I prefer in book format almost, because you get the plot in the present um but then you're also getting reflections from people in the future on these events and you haven't got to those events yet so it adds this sense of foreboding that something really bad is going to happen soon um so i really like that and we don't get that really in the movie because that would obviously be really hard to um adapt onto the screen so, yeah, I prefer it ready in book format, although I will admit that Sissy Spacek is the perfect Carrie. No offence to Chloe Grace Mort uh, Chloe Grace Mortez? I think that's her name. Um, she just comes off as more of one of the uh, mean girls in the books than the very innocent Carrie, um, and Sissy Spacek pulls that off perfectly. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to go back to reading that and, um, I'm going to update you in a bit, probably when I finished it because it's actually really short. So, um, yeah, I'll check in with you in a little bit and then we'll decide on what we're doing next. Okay, so, um, I finished Carrie. <laughs> Ended up being a 3.75. It was good and... Obviously, we know it was King's first novel, um, so it's outstanding by, you know, being a debut. Um, but two things that brought the rating down for me was, one, a lot of King's iconic horror is off screen. We don't actually get to see it. It's left up to the reader's imagination. Um, and I felt you could have done more with that, especially the uh, telekinesis. Um, and then the second is there's quite a few books that King wrote after this that just do similar premises a lot better. So, um, the one that I can think of that I have read prior that still sticks with me to this day is The Dead Zone. That does something very similar a lot better. Um, and I think just King's later works in general are a lot 
better than his early works, which is the case for most authors. Um, so now I have read Carrie and Salem's Lot. Salem's Lot was just better than Carrie by far. Um, I do have Rage to read next, which is under the pen name Richard Bachman. Um, and then it'll be The Shining. And I have been warned in advance that the book of The Shining is very different from the movie The Shining. And I'm not sure where I'm going to fall on this because I love the movie of The Shining with Jack Nichols. Um, so I don't even know if I'm going to like the book version. But there we are. Um, but that thing um, takes out a lot of King's most iconic works. Um, but also his earliest. And then we get to move into stuff. Um, in my view, that's just better. We've got It to come, The Dead Zone, um, Cujo, Christine, Firestarter. Um, and that's just the ones I can name off the top of my head. Um, that I just can't wait to get to. So that's them. Um, I think I'm going to do my 10 chapters of Malice now. Um, and get that out of the way and get that started at least because as I said before this book is hefty um, and then I'm going to start people we meet on vacation um, I'll check back in with you once I've read this <laughs> of Malice um, and despite not reading high fantasy for a long time this was actually really interesting um, I haven't got much of a clue what's going on right now we're introduced to a lot of characters a lot of lore um, and it's a lot to wrap your brain around but from what I can understand a long time ago, there was something called the God War, um, which was essentially a war between two gods, it, um, and it impacted the humans and the giants. Um, this war led to a scourging that killed off most of the giants, um, but it was all a deception. Um, and then we're introduced to a whole host of characters. So we've got... Um, a king's counsellor working with a queen of another kingdom to essentially usurp the um, king um, and he's also made a deal with this god the trickster god um, to reignite the god war um, then we've got uh, a warrior whose family was killed by giants um, in Castell, um, we've got the siblings Corban and Cowan, um, who, you know, are growing up um, in Dunkerrig. Um, they're not of any high status, really, um, but Corbin is going to be taking um, what they call the Long Night soon, which is where boys go through trials to become men. Um, there's Vardis, a warrior from another kingdom, who's currently protecting the crown prince um, in his war band. Um, you know, th there's a lot of different perspectives. Um, all I can really gather from this section is... Um, we're just being introduced to the characters, this world, this history. Um, and it seems that the land is on the cusp of something. Um, as there are things called giant stones which contain text from when 
um, the giants were around um, and those have become bleeding um, the Baglan forest with Corbin fragments himself one day he has this strange vision or dream and at the very end of chapter 9 um, if something happens um, we don't know where it is but one of Corbin's friends um, homesteads is on fire so yeah uh, I can't fault John John Green's writing it's really good really easy to follow um, you know but there's a lot it's it reminds me almost of like almost Game of Thrones like in terms of lore and the factions and the different parts of this kingdom and how they all have their own independent rulers who are ruled by um, a high king um, so it's in terms of like um, hierarchy some of the politics and a smidgen of the law it reminds me a bit of Game of Thrones um, I don't know how dark it's going to get um, I don't know whether it's grim dark it just says high fantasy on the back but this could be grim dark um, so yeah I'm excited to see where this goes um, tomorrow I will be reading up to chapter 20 which is page 149 so if I range it up to 150 it's only about 70 pages I have to read tomorrow and that takes me pretty close to the quarter mark I think um, so yeah this should hopefully have no trouble finishing this before the end of the month but I am going to read in segments because just to get back into sort of reading these kinds of books but yeah it was really enjoyable there's a lot of interesting characters my favorite character that I've just been introduced to so far would be Gar the stable master um, but yeah I'm, I'm excited to see more of what's going on here but um, after the depressing novel that was Carrie and the slightly depressing nature of the opening of this book I'm going to go on to people we meet on vacation um, and I will give you an update when I'm when I've started that hey guys um, probably as you can tell from the location I am back home for a little bit um, and yeah my reading plans didn't really go to plan this week considering it's Saturday um, I'm only now updating you um, I have only read one book since I last updated you which was Mr. Smooth by B.R. Wild um, and that was only a really short novella <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but the reading bug is back with me um, so today I'm planning to read Sorry Not Sorry by Emily James <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> and then make a start on people we meet on vacation um, if I can today otherwise I'll be starting up tomorrow so <clears throat> this is the plan for today and I'm going to update you in a bit right, so I'm still at home it's now Sunday evening um, it's almost nine o'clock in the evening. Um, I didn't do what I was going to said I was going to do yesterday. Um, instead, what I did is I read um, the sex tape series by Seven Room. Now, Seven Room is an indie author that publishes um, both high spice contemporary books and high spice taboo romance. Um, if you know, you know that the series, I'm not going to go into too much detail for it because I don't think YouTube will like it. Um, but basically, I thought it was a trilogy. It's actually four books. Um, first book was great. 
second book was better, third book was a real disappointment. Um, the reason I'm not going to read book four is this series um, and this relationship in general relies on a kink that every time I read about it, think about it, someone mentions it, it makes me want to vomit. Um, and even though the scenes are really short, every time it was mentioned it really put me off. It really put me off the characters and the relationship. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of done with that. But the reason I got back into reading Seven Rue's books was because of Sin. Now, Seven Rue put on Twitter that um, an image an artist had created. Um, an NSFW 18 plus image. Um, and basically said that she wrote a book that featured a situation exactly like the one in this image and I was hella intrigued um, by both the image and that tweet. Um, so this is so far two books I think, there's Sin and Sin 2. Um, so I have this. Um, but I did start another book um, that I think I got it requested from Edelweiss and it's called A History of the Vampire in Popular Culture. Now this isn't a chronolo chronology or encyclopedia of vampire history. It's just the author Violet Fenn looking at the portrayal of vampires in specific media throughout time. So in the first part of the book she talks about um, where we first see vampires or our sort of idea of the vampire emerging um, in literature and this is in classical poetry um, and then how vampires inspired both um, Lord Byron and Mary Shelley in their works and she ends that segment with the publication of the pinnacle of vampire literature which is Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, so that's kind of talking about the historical element. Um, this dense portion is talking about vampire weaknesses, starting with garlic. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some really interesting factoids, bits about literature. Um, I don't know how far she's going to get into popular culture, but I hope she reaches Twilight. Because I really want to see someone who's studied and researched vampires I do on Twilight. Because in my personal opinion, the vampires in Twilight aren't vampires. I'm sorry, but they're not. <laughs> if you look at what a vampire is in terms of mythology, um, especially where they originated from in, you know, Hungary, Transylvania, those kind of areas, um, those vampires are actually closer to the modern version of zombies than vampires. Um, they are the typical undead. Um, the vampires in Twilight, with the way they sparkle, uh, the way they integrate themselves into human society, um, and all of this stuff, is actually more based on Celtic fairies. Um, and that's amazing. Like, if Stephanie Meyer had acknowledged that, that they weren't vampires, that they were Celtic fairies, but could be seen as vampires... Um, would have been on point because Celtic vampire, uh, Celtic fairies like vampires do drink blood. Um, but it's not the only thing they sustain themselves on. They are known to have a wide variety of abilities, um, which is obviously shown in, you know, mind reading, empathy. That there's a lot of uh, talents among the vampires in Twilight. Um. And then the way they look, the way they're not burnt if they go out in the sun, but rather sparkle adds to this allure about them. And we can see that with Bella almost, like the way they smell, the way they move, the way they look. It's all extremely alluring, um, which very heavily leans towards fairy rather than vampire. So, yeah, I'm interested to see how Violet Fenn mix out so that is going to be my evening tonight basically I'm going to go and have a shower in a minute because 
my hair needs washing because it'll be fierce. Um, and then I'm going to try and finish a history of the vampire. Um, I also pre-ordered Waterstones exclusive editions of both Heart of the Sun Warrior um, and Empire of the Damned. Which I shouldn't have really done, but I'm doing it. Um, Heart of the Sun Warrior does come out at the end of this month. Um, the Waterstones exclusive paperback comes out at the end of this month. Um, so I have pre-ordered that. And then Empire of the Dam doesn't drop until February next year. Um, but it's only like 10 days, 2 weeks after my birthday. So I will have an excuse for getting that by the time it drops. Um, so yeah, those are coming soon. And as soon as I get my hands on them, I cannot wait for Empire of the Dam. If you've read my review of Empire of the Vampire, you know I absolutely adored it. The only tiny issue I had with it was we do get a gay romance between Aaron DeCoste and John Baptiste. And I would have liked that expanded on more for it to be a more um, focused relationship. We've got to see more of it rather than this one kind of illicit scene. Um, or have... Um, the main character himself, BK. Um, that would have been great. Um, especially seeing as he's got the history fit like Gabriel, um, Gabriel de Leon. Um, obviously, spoiler, you may skip ahead. Um, his partner and child dies because of the vampires. And that would have been an amazing reason to have made him it's bisexual, if not gay. You know, like he's gone through this major trauma with the woman he loved, and so forth. He's not looking for another woman and just happens to fall in love with a man. And he does have plenty of options. Like the other Silver Saints, for a start. Aaron DeCoste and him, the humour, the banter between them, especially when they don't really like each other at the beginning, just screams like hate to love relationship. Not enemies to lovers, but like angsty, broody gay romance would have been amazing. Um, but I really like the way everything went. And then Pray the Damned, all the reveals we got towards the end, not only regarding the Grail, but Gabriel himself and um, the blood he comes from. Amazing. And I can't wait to see what Jay Christoph does in Empire of the Damned. And I hope. I hope for a change that Jay Kristoff writes more than a trilogy because all of his books every single one has been part of a trilogy so you had the um, Storm Dancer I've still not read that one um, Nevernight was a trilogy Life Light was a trilogy um, the Aurora Rising series with uh, Amy Kaufman a trilogy Illuminate a trilogy and I need more. I genuinely need more. I still haven't read Dark Dawn because I've got a love hate relationship with that series. I adored Nevernight but despised Godgrave. And the only reason I despise Godgrave is because Jay Kristoff had the heinous idea of making Ash a love interest after what she did in the first book. Like, I am sorry, I am not forgiving that girl and I fucking hate the book because of it. So it's really put me off going into Dark Dawn. Because in my mind, I, I've managed to avoid all the fucking spoilers for the series, which is amazing. But in my mind, she's either gonna end up with Ash or it's gonna be like this thruple and I want no part of that. I want Ash to drop dead so quickly. I don't care. I don't care if she's involved. I want her to drop it. I'm sorry. Um, so I haven't finished that trilogy. But I have read Illuminae in its entirety. Really enjoyed it. That last book especially. Even though I didn't care for the main couple. The reveals and how everything tied together. Absolute perfection. Um, but I'm hoping with Empire of the Vampire. Because the books are significantly longer than anything we've had from Jay Kristoff before. 
that he will actually write a longer series. Because there's so much you can go into. Like, we do get a lot of lore and a lot of history in the first book. But it doesn't go into too much depth. Because you're constantly flashing back to the past and the present, past and the present, past and the present. So even when you're in the past or any of this stuff, it's only really brief. Um, so I want to know more about that. I want to know about previous Silver Saints. I want to go right back to the beginning and see how Sam Michon became Sam Michon. Um, you know, and then we've got uh, this whole arc with the rail. There's so much going on. And I want it to be longer. I want this to be like a four, five, six book series. Because it is arguably one of the best series J. Kristoff has ever written in terms of setting, characters, you know, all that. It, it's J. Kristoff's. I think this is J. Kristoff's magnum opus. Um... I initially thought the Nevernet was going to be his magnum opus, and then when he dropped Emperor the Vampire, I never read it, basically as soon as it came out, and I devoured that book in, I think, two days. I binged read the entire thing in two days. Um, I knew straight away this this was going to be his magnum opus. Like, G Emperor the Vampire is to G. Kristoff what Stormlight is to Brandon Sanson. It, oh, I can't wait. But like I've said, um, I'm going to finish watching my YouTube video, go have a shower, and then I'm just going to chill and wait. And I'll see you in a bit.